Why, good evening, everybody, all you saints of God. It's Sunday night. It's time to go to church. Yes. This is your evening evangelist, Brother Freddie Clark. And uh, we've got the word of the Lord for you tonight. So uh, you that's hungry for bread, man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So great things are going to happen tonight here on the uh, telecast. Don't forget the oil. Online, internet, live stream, O-I-L. The first letter of each word will tell you what is going to be poured out upon you tonight. O-I-L, oil. Online, internet, live stream. Mom, how are you feeling tonight? Wonderful. Uh, we've got the guitar out. You know, we've been, in, I don't want to say we've been in a rut, but it's been feeling good playing this music every time we start the live stream and i really think there's some people out there that likes to hear it yeah. i know they like to hear you sing they love to hear you sing <laughs> fishing for I a compliment I there i know i do <laughs> well then take the microphone and let's do something that will right. please everybody that's got a praying mama and a praying church sounds good to me we'll be in the key of 4 sharps for all you music students out there not long ago I was thinking of home and I wondered if mama was there all alone I thought I'd drop by like I'd done before but the sound from within made me stop at the door. She was praying. A sound that this world seldom hears. Praying. Her words were pleading and clear. The sound of her voice as she spoke my name brought tears to my eyes, my heart filled with shame. Praying, praying for someone like me. I was walking one night and I felt so alone My heart was weary from the troubles I'd known I hadn't noticed a church that stood near Till the sound from within seemed to fill the air they were praying a sound that this world seldom hears praying the children that God loves so dear outside in the darkness I could not see, but I could picture them down on their knees, praying, praying for someone like me. Praying for someone like me and uh, Paul said he would that men pray everywhere, and that goes for women too, lifting up holy hands without wrath nor doubting. Pray without ceasing. The disciples learned how to cast out devils and heal the sick and raise the dead just by being of Jesus, but they had to be taught something. Bet you can't guess what it was. They came to him and asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. 
And so men ought always to pray. So uh, keep on praying. Your family is going to be saved. And the circle in heaven is not going to be broken. But while we got the guitar, Mom, you want to try something else? How about you singing one? All right. Would that be good? Let's try it. All right. I have to play the guitar, so you're going to have to hold the mic. You help me sing this song, please. Okay, I'll tell you what. You sing a verse, so I'll find out what it is. All right. I know it's in D. That would be uh, two sharps for all you music yeah. students. Okay. What is it? I walk one day. Oh, yeah. Okay. That, the name of that song is called Take Up Thy Cross. Okay. That would be a good idea for everybody Thank to do. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I walk. One day upon a country road And there a stranger journey to Bent low beneath the burden of his load It was the cross, the cross I knew take up thy cross and follow me I hear the blessed Savior call how can I make a lesser sacrifice when Jesus paid it all I cried Lord Jesus and he spoke my name I saw his hands all bruised and torn I stoop to kiss away those marks of shame. The shame for me that he had borne. Take up thy cross and follow me. I hear the blessed say. Oh, how can I make a lesser sacrifice when Jesus paid it all? How can I make a lesser sacrifice when Jesus paid Paid it all. Go ahead, Mama, and talk to us tonight and bless our hearts real good. Thank you, Lord, for such a mighty, mighty Savior. Thank you, Jesus. You know, um, <coughs> in uh, Isaiah chapter 53, it says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom? is the arm of the Lord revealed. I believe God wants to reveal his arm. You say, what is the arm of God? The arm of God is his power gifts, faith, healing, and miracles. And I love the book of Isaiah where it says in Isaiah 51, 9, Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of God. When you get into intercession and you get into prayer, you know, I love to just sometimes just have the word open and I'll be praying and I'll look right into the word of God and I'll say what it's saying. I'll pray what it's saying. I believe tonight the Lord wants you to know that there's there's not going to be a uh, arm in the synagogue that's all bound up. I believe he's going to stretch forth tonight his mighty arm. He's going to awake his mighty arm tonight, it says, as he did in the ancient of days. 
as he opened the Red Sea and as he moved across the waters. People tonight, I believe tonight God wants to touch you. He wants to heal you by outstretching his arm. So have faith tonight and believe him and see God bigger than your problem. You tell your problem, look at my big God. He can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all. You can even ask or think. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, Mama will get to preaching and exhorting, and uh, sometimes she shouldn't quit so quick. Anyway, we want all you folks out in Internet land to go gather the sick up, stretchers and wheelchairs and all manner of uh, afflicted people. Get them around the, the tube, the TV, the computer, the phone. Uh, Whatever you're watching by, get around, get around, get around uh, the screen tonight. And be ready for your miracle. It's coming up. But as you know, he sends his word and heals them and casts out spirits by his word. So we're going to have to feed your soul a little because God does not confirm the Reader's Digest. You've heard me say that many times. He only confirms his word. And before I read the text, I would like to remind you of our newsletter that comes out, Abraham. It comes out uh, whenever we can afford to mail it to you. We, we send it out and a lot of you get it. Send it uh, a request to our mailing address, which is Freddie Clark, Evangelist Freddie Clark, Post Office Box 625, Rocky Mountain, Virginia. Box 625, Rocky Mount, Virginia, 24151. We'll receive your letter, and next time we mail it, you'll get a copy. And when you're mailing uh, your request, you don't forget, we're in the tent ministry still, as you can see back here. And uh, most of my life I've been in a tent. I was out of it for a few years, but when COVID struck, I went back into the tent. Well, it's a good thing I did for, because uh, a lot of things happened in the church world and revival was something that the government determined wasn't going to happen. But it's starting to happen again. And uh, we, until we start the tent, we'll be Sunday nights here at 8 o'clock in front of the tent mural. And uh, you can feel like you're right in the tent meeting while we're preaching the gospel to you tonight. And don't forget... Uh, our expenses as we go on the road, only our sponsors send us from city to city. Uh, the churches don't do that. Pastors don't do that. We have to do that ourselves. And did you notice how much diesel fuel was out in California these days, Mama? No, but it, it went up high here. It's almost $5. Oh, well, out there, $6.25. Wow. But we're still going to come to your town. If you help us buy the diesel fuel, that is, and uh, get the equipment up to par and uh, take care of the workers. You can't uh, muzzle the ox that dreads out the corn, and the husbandman must be first partaker of the fruit. Uh, let there be some meat in the house, and when you bring your offering to the house of God that puts meat there, you go there, eat the meat, throw the bones away. <laughs> That's what my mom always said. And get your soul fed in the house of God, which is right here tonight online, okay? Amen. Now, I've never been a pastor. I'm an evangelist. And uh, I'm uh, looking out for the congregation that tunes in every week because I feel responsible for you. All right, let's read it. You notice a strange title for the message tonight, which is entitled... The Black Horse Rides. Spooky, huh? Scary? Strange? Well, we'll clear that up right now. It's found in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, the last book of the Bible. Chapter 6, verse 5. Now, in verse 5, we have the opening of the third seal. And the third beast makes a commandment. The third beast stands in front of the open seal and says, come and see. So tonight I want you to come and see what God's doing. I want you to come and hear 
first of all, what God is doing because you've got to hear it before you can see it. Faith comes by hearing, and then faith produces miracles. Now, there are four horses in this chapter, and I firmly believe they're all riding. Somebody said, well, they have to ride in sequence. I don't think so. Uh, throughout the last 2,000 years since John was on the Isle of Patmos, I think they've been riding, to tell you the truth. But for sure, they've been riding since 1900 when the Holy Ghost was first poured out on this Holy Ghost nation of the United States of America. And from here, missionary work went around the world by the power of the Holy Ghost. He gave Noah 120 years to build the ark, and he left it open seven days after Noah got on the boat. A day is a year with God. On the prophetic calendar, he might be going to give you seven more years. But since the Holy Ghost was poured out, it's been 120 years to 2020. Uh, time's running out, saints, and you don't realize it, but it is. So let me read it now. And he had opened the third seal, and I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld. Here it comes. And lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Did you know that this whole world is weighed in the balance tonight? It's hanging in the balance. There's World War III is about to break out in, the, in Europe and Russia. I don't believe it's going to be World War III because that's the Gog and Magog War. But what did Jesus say? You shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. Well, this is no rumor. This is a war going on. And they've been going on since 1900, the turn of the last century. We've had World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq. As the red horse is riding, and prior to that, the white horse, which is the Antichrist horse, it's been riding. We just don't know who the Antichrist is, but the system has been in place, uh, particularly over the last 120 or 122 years, you see. Well, getting back to the black horse, that's the famine. I would have to tell you what I believe. I believe we're going to have a famine in America this year, this summer, this fall. So you better stock up and prepare because the grain shortages are bad. And the uh, oil is being cut off from Russia, and Biden will not open up the pipeline in the United States. So I can't see the prices going any lower. The fuel prices are just going to keep going higher. It could be a shortage on everything, although we have the supply chain sh shortage, and there's shortages everywhere. And I don't want anybody caught without food. And if Jesus has to, he still knows how to multiply Amen. the loaves and the fishes. Right. He did it for 5,000 men, not counting the women and the kids. He did it twice, the next time for 4,000 men, not counting women and children. So your God shall supply all your needs yes. according to his riches and glory. He's able to speak anything into existence. Now, see what the black horse is saying. The balances are in the hand of the rider. Do you remember when Darius the Mede dammed up the Euphrates River and crawled in under the walls of Babylon the very night that the hand appeared on the wall and wrote the words, Meanie, Meanie, Tiku, Eupharsin? And Daniel came in and interpreted the tongue, the other tongue. I have numbered your kingdom and finished it. Thou art weighed, weighed in the balances, and you're found wanting. So there's balances in the hand of the black horse of famine. And I trust that you come up on the right side of the balance. 
I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. From there we go to the fourth seal, which is the pale horse of disease and viruses and plagues and man-made concoctions in foreign countries and sent into this country and around the world to kill people and depopulate the planet. So there's no way to escape, according to the Bible, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The white horse, Antichrist, the red horse, warfare, war, black horse, famine, and the pale horse, disease and pestilence. But I'm only going to deal with the black horse tonight. And there's four things that the black horse dealt with in his balance. I will repeat them with you. They are commodities. They are food products. They are exactly wheat, barley, oil, and wine. That's my message tonight. Those four commodities which is a good thing to be in commodities. That way you won't be caught with worthless paper in your hands when they change the currency to blockchain digital cryptocurrency from the banks and the large corporations where they can control everything you buy and sell. And with the new digital ID, it can cut it off at any time and make you a non-person so that you cannot buy and sell. I'm telling you to pay attention tonight. There's a black horse riding. Famines in the world. 10% of the world is starving right now. And just because you live in America and you are, aren't hungry yet doesn't mean it's not going to happen. That's why we've got to trust God that he will fill up our pantry and our flour barrel shall not go dry nor the cruise of oil fail until the days of the famine is over. Until Jesus calls us. What are the four things again? This is a test. I'm quizzing you now. I, I caught you. First thing is what? Wheat. Second thing is what? Barley. The third thing is what? Oil. The fourth thing? Wine. All right. Let's get started on it. I'm going to read a little bit tonight on these four items. Luke chapter 16. Now, the reason I'm going to a verse and reading it out of the Bible, uh, that is the original English. That's not a, a, any mutilated version that I, I don't bother with man-made concoctions. Uh, I think I can understand enough of the old English to uh, not be stupid or foolish. I think the spirit of wisdom and understanding can come upon me. But Mama is after me all the time about quoting the scripture so that you know I'm not making it up. See, sometimes I just fly in the word because I love it so much. And I'm thinking you know all that. But sad to say, not too many people know the word of God today. It takes study to know the word of God. When I was a young man, a lot more people knew the word of God. I could just sail through my sermon and they'd shout me down because they knew what I was talking about. So Mama makes me go to the Scripture for a reference. And now I am in Luke chapter 16 and verse 7. In this particular parable, there are four main characters. There is the certain rich man. That's God Almighty, the Lord. There is a steward. That is you. And there are also the Lord's debtors. And that's really you, because we're in debt. Not to the flesh to live after the flesh, for if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. And finally, there is the friends of the mammon of unrighteousness. But I really want to deal with one of the characters the steward. Now, this steward was sloppy keeping books. He was cooking the books. 
He had wasted his Lord's goods, like many of you have done. A lot of wasted time. A lot of wasted opportunities. And the Lord came up and said, Brother Stewart, and if your name is Brother Stewart, don't take it to heart. I understand that you've wasted my goods and I'm going to put you out of the ministry. I'm going to take your bookkeeping job from you. Uh, give an account of yourself. Do you believe we're all going to give an account to God? Well, the steward says within himself. He doesn't say, I think I'll straighten the books, balance the books. Remember the balance? And get my life straight and get back into my Lord's good graces. Instantly, he has a, an agenda, an ulterior motive. Uh, he is thinking after the flesh. The carnal mind, God's greatest enemy. I said, what am I going to do? I can't dig. I don't know how to work. I've been living off the government. I can't beg. I can't be a street person. Uh, I'm ashamed of not having a job. I know what I'm going to do. I'm resolved what to do. So that when he puts me out of the ministry or out of the stewardship, I'll be able to be taken into everybody's house and everybody will love me and put their arm around me and pay my bills for me and my wages and take care of me because I'm going to give them a hot deal. I'm going to give them a discount. I'm going to give them bargain basement salvation, 7-Eleven gospel, shortcut time. Yeah. Got to give them a charismatic substitution for the power and the demonstration of Paul's gospel. Let me go. So the first place he went, knocked on the door of the Lord's debtor. Now remember, you steward, you have a ministry, but you're also a debtor. You are ministering to people because they're not as smart as you are. They don't know as much about the spirit world as you do, or you wouldn't be their minister. So these little dummies, these little... Lord's debtors are just so glad to see you making a pastoral call, a ministerial call today. Well, hello, Brother Stewart. It's good to see you. Is this a hospital call, a grocery delivering service call, a babysitting call? No, I'm serious today. He was serious, all right. Instead of telling the Lord's debtor he was being put out of the ministry, for wasting God's goods, time and opportunities. He said, I got to do business with you today, Lord's debtor. Verse 7. I, you, it's not really about the uh, wheat, is it? Yeah, it's about the wheat. Now, I'm covering the wheat first, all right? Remember the four things, wheat, barley, oil, and wine. What about the wheat? How much do you owe my Lord? the king, in wheat. How much wheat do you owe him? Well, said the Lord's debtor, uh, I owe him a hundred measures of wheat. And if you can get anything through your mind tonight in TV land, you owe God 100% of the wheat. Well, what's the wheat, Brother Freddie? Well, what, what does wheat make? Flour. What does flour make? Bread. The only reason that you grow wheat is to make bread. And are you eating tonight on the bread of life? Man cannot live on by bread alone. And so you owe God 100% of the wheat, 100% of the Word of God. Which means you can't do what the steward's about to tell this Lord's debtor. Oh, now, son, you just sit down and don't think about it. And trust me. Uh, I, I'm here for your good. I, I know more. I know better than you do. Sit down quick and write 50. No, write four score, all right? The oil was 50, all right? Sit down quick and write four score. That's 80. Now, is that bargain basement salvation? Is that a shortcut gospel? That's not Paul's gospel. Paul's gospel is not a whole lot of talk. It's word and deed. 
80% of the Word of God is not 100% of the Word of God. Every time they slice off any part of this Bible, it's always the potent portions that would set them free and deliver them. You can't fight against the power of God and the uh, gifts of the Spirit and the supernatural demonstration and expect it to show up when you get in trouble. You have got to embrace it throughout and all the time. So we have here uh, a guy that's given a shortcut onto the Lord's dinner. He doesn't know any better. He thinks he's getting a big deal. Wow. And so you can't cut off all of the Word of God because people aren't stupid. I mean, they can read. And if you cut it in half like the steward cut the oil in half, uh, everybody's going to smell a rat. They're going to know you, that you're, you've dropped something out of the gospel and out of the Bible. And so 80% is not the answer. While I'm here, I want to tell you about verse 6. The oil was the same way. He went to the next Lord's debtor and said, Now, what do you owe my Lord the king? I owe him 100% of the oil. <laughs> Do you believe that you owe God 100% of the oil of gladness, of the oil of the anointing, of the oil of the Holy Ghost, which is the oil? You owe, do, do you believe you owe God 100% oil? Or are you going to let somebody come along and tell you, now, Lord's debtor, you don't know too much and I know better than you do so I'm going to cut the oil right in half and you'll never know the difference and that's true most people never do know the difference when the anointing is cut off at the pulpit or in the operation of the spirit if somebody don't know what they're doing if somebody does know what's going to happen or what they're doing and they cut it off you would never know the difference unless you had seen everything at all and 100% of the oil then, then you'd know what you were missing now you know why they won't let you see a few things or hear from a few folks. And that's because the oil was cut in half. Sit down quick and write 50 and the debt's paid. The debt is not paid just because you cut the oil in half. You still owe God 100% of the oil of the Holy Ghost in your life. I'm talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And while I'm on that, remember the Ten virgins, five wise and five foolish. The only difference in the two of them was the oil. The wise had brought oil in their vessel. I've said this over and over. And the foolish brought no oil in their vessel. So when their lamp burnt out and their wick needed a good trimming, like most folks need a good trimming, they could not replenish their gift and their talent and their ministry, which was their lamp. There was nothing to replenish it with. And when the bridegroom came, they ran out all over town trying to play catch-up ball and find oil for their vessel. And they missed the pre-wrath rapture of the saints. Too bad how sad you're dead. You should have worked on the oil every day. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore, God, even thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness, even above thy fellow. Fill your vessel every day. Get a Holy Ghost refill tonight while I'm preaching right now. Put up your hand, start praising Jesus, and the Holy Ghost will hit you. Because the Holy Ghost has come to glorify Jesus. If you glorify Jesus, the Holy Ghost will come. Simple math. Praise him now and get some oil in your vessel. Get a refill. Because tomorrow, you may have to replenish your little lamp. And you don't want your lights put out. Jesus told the church of Ephesus, you have left your first love, and if you don't get it back, I'm going to remove your candlestick, which means I'm going to put your lights out. You want your lamp burning? The city set on a hill cannot be hid. You're going to put your little old lamp under a bushel? No, you're going to get filled of oil right now. Remember... Online, internet, live stream. Get filled of oil. Keep your lamp burning. 
So you cannot get by on half of the oil of the anointing or 80% of the Word of God. And anybody that thinks that's going to happen is listening to somebody that's just recently been put out of the ministry. and you got no business listening to them. For if any come on to you, Paul said, and preach another Jesus or preach another gospel that you've not heard or not received, you might do well to bear with him. Receive him not into your house. Bid him not good speed. Don't even eat dinner with him. For he that bids him good speed is partaker with his evil deeds. All right. Let me move on to Gideon. Uh, just you look it up. I'll give you the, the, the reference. Judges chapter 6, 11. Gideon being tormented by the Midianites. Israel being starved to death in a famine, a black horse riding with balances in his hand. Even back then, Gideon is so confused in his state of fear of the enemy, the devil, the Midianites, all one million of them, that he's in a wine press thrashing out wheat. Now, I told you I'm going to talk about the wheat first. I'm going to hurry up on this wheat business, although I have covered the oil. I covered the oil with the steward here that gave the 50% and the 10 virgins wise and foolish. That covers the oil. So I've, I've got the oil covered, and now I want to completely cover the wheat. All right, the wheat is being thrashed by a man in a wine press. Now, here's how confusing he was. He should have been mashing grapes in a wine press. Or he should have been thrashing grain at the granary. Because my God is not the author of confusion. And there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. For fear have torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. Let the love of God be shed abroad in your heart tonight by the Holy Ghost. In the midst of his chaos, a voice came from heaven and said, Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. So God has mercy. No matter how off the track you've been, God still, as long as there's life, there's hope, and there's breath in your body, and you still got a spark, we can work with you. If you're reprobate and turned over, conscience is seared, we don't have any time to waste time. But if there's hope for you, there is if you're watching tonight, or you wouldn't be concerned enough to watch. You're going to start coming out of your confusion and start thrashing out wheat, and God's going to call your name and use you for great victory. Hallelujah for the wheat. Did you know that except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone? But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. Think of it. You lonely, depressed people listening to me tonight. Think of it. If you, if you could just drop dead, and I mean to the flesh and to the old Adamic nature and to the natural man, if you could die, fall to the ground before God and just die, you would bring forth much fruit, just like a corn of wheat. And if you died and brought forth much fruit, you would never be lonely again because you've got so much fruit surrounding you that you're going to run for your life just to get peace of mind and get an hour's rest. Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die. It abides alone. Lonely hearts club. But if it dies, it brings forth much fruit and will never be lonely again. You got that? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God. All right. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. There's a lot of you people being sifted right now. Economically, psychologically, politically, financially. 
in many ways. You're being sifted. And the old devil is sifting you. But Jesus said he prayed for you in the garden. John 17, what an intercessory prayer that was. And he's still interceding in heaven for you now. We come through the veil, which is to say his flesh, to get to the spirit, which is the invisible God, through his Father, who is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. You never see him except in the face of Jesus Christ, who is the fullness of the Godhead bodily, the image of the invisible God, who dwelleth in a light which no man can approach, whom no man hath seen nor can see. No, no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the, in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him to be in existence. Yep. If you've seen me, Philip, you've seen the Father. So thank God, the invisible, mighty God that fills all in all has got a body. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he's got a name. And his name is Jesus Christ. And everything that you do in word or deed, see to it that you do it all in the name of Jesus Christ. That way you'll have an official seal and stamp of authority and reality upon it. All right, Simon, Simon, Satan have desired to have you that it might sift you as weak, but I prayed for you, Jesus said. I have prayed for you that your faith fail not. And when thou art converted, I, that blows my mind. Here's Simon Peter raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out devils for three and a half years, needing to be converted. This happened just before the crucifixion, you see. He'd been ministering of Jesus for three and a half years. When thou art converted, so there's hope for all of you that feel like you're backslid or you missed the mark. After you've had a great run and a great ministry and now you feel like you fell on your face. When thou art converted, Peter, strengthen thy brethren. Amen. Now, how do I know if you're converted? You will strengthen the brethren. You won't run around gossiping and backbiting and st stabbing them in the back and talking about them, driving division, opposition, and offenses. You won't do that. If you're doing that, you need to get converted. You're going to have to bridle your tongue. It's the one member of the body that nothing can control but God Almighty. And God is a spirit. And when the spirit controls your tongue, brother, you will be speaking another language before you know it. <laughs> oh, yes. Come on, shout a little bit. Great. I'm going to stop and let you shout. Uh, I've given you so much word, you're about to choke. All right. Burp. Gulp. Choke it down. Sweet in your mouth, is it? But bitter in your belly, I suppose it will be tomorrow when you try to live it. It'll be bitter in your belly. Oh, but mama, it's sweet tonight. Yes. Sweet in the mouth. Okay. Recess is over. Back to work. Wave your hand in victory. Say, thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. Thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus for about to be healing my body. Thank you for filling me with the oil so that I won't have to face the Antichrist as the foolish remnant that for the most part will be beheaded called the tribulation saints. Remember the two churches, the translated church and the persecuted church during the three and a half years of 42 months. Okay. When you're converted, you'll strengthen the brethren. All right, I think I've covered the wheat and the oil. How about the barley? All right, let's get the barley. I refer you to the book of Ruth, chapter 1 and verse 22. And if you found it, remember Ruth. Uh, you have to remember Naomi. That's her mother-in-law. She... She had a husband called Elimelech. And they had two sons, Malon and Chilion. 
one day they decided to leave the church. Well, I mean, they lived in the town of Bethlehem when Jesus was born. Do you know what Bethlehem means? It means the house of bread. Ooh, couldn't we use some wheat down there? And some barley, too. Well, we're getting to the barley. Yes, Bethlehem, the house of bread. Your church is the house of bread. Take your tithes to the storehouse. There'll be meat in the house, and you'll get something to eat. The preacher will be forced to preach you the message that you need to hear, forced by the Holy Ghost to do it, because you brought tithes and offerings to the storehouse. The storehouse is where you're fed, and you'll get fed. Hallelujah. <laughs> and when you go to Bethlehem, the house of bread, which is the church, and you get fed there, as long as you stay there, you'll be in good shape. I, I get a lot of people in my tent that I have to pray for. Every time I go to town, I have to pray for the same people because they won't go to church. Uh, the church is where they got healed. And just as soon as they get sick again, you know what they do? They'll go back to church. Now you know why they get sick again. God allows it to keep them in church. Now, that being said, if you just stay in church in the first place, you might not even get sick. Think about it. Well, Elimelech got the big idea to leave the church, and so he went down to Moab and took his wife, Naomi. Now his two sons found Moabitish Gentile heathens, women to marry in Moab. They were Moabites, Moabitesses. It's a sad thing when you marry outside the faith, outside of the Pentecostal experience. All you're going to do is have hell. But you never learn, do you? God can send you in the church to help me to keep you in the church and not haul you off on a tangent somewhere and wind up in Hades. Okay. Now, of course, Elimelech died. She lost her husband. Because she was out of church and down at Moab, she lost her two sons. They both died too, Melon and Chilion. And now all she had left was two uh, heathen daughters-in-law. And she said, I I've had it, man. I'm going back to church. Or that is, I'm going back to uh, Bethlehem, the house of bread, the church. She rose of her daughters-in-law to return because she had heard how the Lord had visited his people in giving them bread. Now, you don't have to wait till God sends a revival to your church. Get to church in the first place and you might bring the revival or start it. Don't wait for the revival to come. Hey, God's moving down at my church. I better get back to church. She heard how that in Bethlehem, God had visited his people and given them bread again. And the famine is over. The famine is why they left, you see. When your church gets in a famine, just stick it out. It'll soon be over with. Elijah was a man of like passions like as we are, and he prayed earnestly, and it did not rain for three and a half years. He prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So if you get to praying, you'll get the famine over with before you know it. The verse I uh, had you look up, Ruth 1.22. So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, which returned out of the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Now we're going to deal with the barley. Now the barley is worth a third of what the wheat's worth. Remember the black horse, a measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. So the barley is pretty cheap. But no matter how cheap it seems, get to church, get to the house of God, get to the Sunday night online internet live stream, 
not the congregation that tunes in every week. Get to work in the vineyard, the field, and start gleaning barley. After she started gleaning barley, Boaz, the guy that she was going to marry, who was a brother to Emelec, by the way, who had enough sense to stay in Bethlehem and not go to Moab, when Boaz saw how good she did, he left her handfuls on purpose. And that's what I'm doing for you tonight. I'm just dumping sheaves and handfuls on top of your head on purpose so you can get oil, wheat, and barley right here in the live stream. Are you getting the message now? Hallelujah. Now, as far as barley is concerned, there's another reference I want you to look up. And I want you to look up 2 Samuel 14, 30. 2 Samuel 14, 30. You won't believe this one. Well, you have to. It's in the Word. This is Absalom. Get, you have to get a background story here. Absalom just killed his brother for forcing his sister. And he's been on the lam for several years. And David's heart is crying for Absalom because he loves him. And Joab gets an old woman to uh, talk King David into calling his son back. David goes along with the old woman of Tekoa and sends Joab to get Absalom in uh, the town that he was in. And I don't know the name of that town right now. But uh, Joab found him and brought him to Jerusalem. But he left him outside the city, out in the country, and put him in a hired house. And so he, w he abode in his own hired house for two years, kind of like Paul did when he went to Rome. And as he sat there, here it is, verse 28, dwelt two full years in Jerusalem, saw not the king's face. Now here's Jerusalem again, the house of God, right? Many people are sitting in the house of God for years and have never seen the king's face. I admonish you to persevere, break through in the spirit, and get a vision of Jesus Christ when you go to church. See him. Look upon his countenance. Hallelujah. Now, Absalom is tired of not seeing the king's face. So he calls for Joab to come and take him to see the king. No man should do a halfway job. Don't bring a sinner halfway to church and leave him there. Get him in to see the king. Let him see the king's face. Well, finally, Absalom couldn't take it no more, so he called Joab. He didn't call him on the phone. They didn't have those things back then. But he sent a message to Joab said, come and take me to see the king. Did Joab do it? No. Did Joab answer his message? No. So Absalom called him again. It doesn't say so, but I can picture Absalom calling him again and again and again. And Joab will not come and finish his job. Was Joab jealous of Absalom because David loved him so much? He did what David wanted. He brought Absalom to Jerusalem, but he never took him in to see David, his father, the king. Your father's a king too. You need to see him. So what happened? Absalom got so frustrated that he looked out, looked out his window one day and said to his servant, that's Joab's field next to my hired house where I've been in prison for two years. Go over there and burn his barley. Burn his barley field. Yes, sir. And so, Absalom had his servant burn Joab's barley field. Guess what? The minute that old field started burning, guess who came a-running? Right on the tear. Yeah, you guessed it. 
the guy that wouldn't come, no matter how many times God called him, he wouldn't come. But brother, you will come to God just as soon as God burns your barley field, just as soon as the wreath is put on your door post, just as soon as you come down with something incurable, just as soon as uh, all is lost and you don't think your kids are ever going to be saved. A thousand things could happen to you that would cause you to lose everything you got. That's your barley field. It's being burned. So what's the message here in the barley? Answer the call that God's put on your life. And don't wait for a tragedy and holocaust and catastrophe to hit you and yours before you come to God and do what you're supposed to do. And take that heathen, that that murderer, that adulterer, that liar, that criminal, that drug head, that drunkard, take him in to see the king and quit doing such a haphazard job. That is why you're weighed in the balance tonight with the black horse riding. Weighed in the balance. God is watching. He's no respecter of persons. And you shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. What have you done, Joab? Have you brought Absalom to Jerusalem and not taken him in to see the king? Prayed him through, laid hands on him, fasted and prayed for him, cast the devil out of him, whatever you have to do. If you haven't done that, your barley is going up in smoke. And Ruth gleaned barley until she received big bundles of barley. So there's nothing like starting from the bottom and climbing the ladder. All right. I got one more thing I got to tell you about, and that is the wine. I've covered the wheat and the barley and the oil, right? Yes. Did I? Yes, you did. Now the wine. Now, of course, I'm not advocating for you to become a drunkard. I'm not telling you to look upon the wine while it is red, while it moveth in the cup, because it biteth like an adder and stingeth like a serpent. Be not drunk on wine wherein there is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit's the new wine. Peter said so on the day of Pentecost. These are not drunk, as you suppose. The bars are not open at the third hour of the day. This is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joe. In the last days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Sons and daughters should prophesy. Young men have visions. Old men have dreams. On my servants and handmaidens will I pour out my spirit. Yep. So, there's an outpouring here of the wine. Now, as far as the wine, uh, I know that Paul told Timothy to take a little wine for his stomach's sake because he had a, an affliction in his stomach and he had to do something for it. It was medicine. Someone said, well, I, I'm a social drinker. I don't drink too much. I just drink a little bit. Okay, let me tell you about the little bit of drink that you do. You social drinker, you. You are drunk. If you're 1% drunk, 10% drunk, 50% drunk, 80% drunk, 100% drunk, drunk, my friend, is drunk. And your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If any man defile the temple, him shall God destroy. Hello. Amen. So I'm not telling you to uh, grow wine in order to get drunk. But I'm speaking about wine spiritually here. And uh, even naturally, there's nothing wrong with having a vineyard because you're going to sell what you grow. I mean, people eat grapes too. And they drink grape juice. You don't have to wait till it ferments and turns alcoholic to drink it. The Bible tells us that no drunkard is ever going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
along with another list, long list of things. But getting back, I want to give you the reference now. Matthew 20, verse 2. Look, look it up. <coughs> Matthew 20, verse 2. I'll soon be done. I, I'm telling you, every night I start these sessions, I say I'm only going to be 15 minutes tonight. But I get into this Word of God, and I can't quit. I can't stop. There's no time in the spirit world. I, I've been in meetings that went for, the preacher preached for 10 minutes, and I thought eternity had set in. And I've been in meetings that went for 10 hours, and I thought it was 10 minutes because everybody was in the spirit where there's no time or distance or gravity. Let's read it. There is a man here who's a householder, just like the one there in uh, back in Luke, the uh, the householder was was the, the good man was the Lord, and in this case the householder is the, again the Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ, who went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. Now verse two, and when he, the Lord, had agreed with the laborers. Say laborers. Labor. You are laborers. We are laborers together with Christ. Be not, God is not uh, unrighteous to forget your labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So you're a laborer. Now, they agreed, the laborers agreed with the Lord for a penny a day. Now, a penny a day don't sound like much, but in the old Bible, in the old days, a penny was a day's wage. You worked all day for a penny. But that penny would be worth today $100 or $200. That's how bad the uh, central banks and the Federal Reserve has stolen and robbed your wealth. Where do you think all these skyscrapers come from in all these cities? They stole your substance and wealth, and they built them. Something had to pay for it, and it was you. All right, this is truth time. He had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, a day's wage, a penny. Imagine how inflation has took off since then. He sent them into his vineyard. All right, say it with me. Vineyard. Vine yard. What? do you grow in a vineyard? Gideon forgot what it was. He was in a wine press threshing out grain. In a vineyard, you grow grapes, okay? Grapes make grapes, grape juice, and wine. And various levels of intoxication. All right. The laborers are in the vineyard. Now, spiritually speaking, the field is the world. The vineyard is every nation where you should be doing something. And if you won't go do something for God, send somebody in your place by proxy who will go and do something and see to it that you finance them good enough to take your place so that you won't be left holding the bag when you stand before the judgment seat. Another pep talk. All right. So he goes out in the third hour and does the same thing. He goes out uh, at the ninth hour and hires them. And every one of them agrees for a penny. He goes out, the, out at the eleventh hour and says, Why are you standing around here in the marketplace shopping at Kroger's and Walmart and Lowe's and not doing anything for God? Why are you got to go to Goodwill every time you run past a Goodwill store? Yep, standing idle in the marketplace. Get to work. I hire you. Do you know God has hired you? Who do you think fed and clothed you and paid your bills and healed you all your life? The Lord God Almighty. He is paying you exactly what you're worth. You must have been doing something for God or he wouldn't have been taking such good care of you. All right. 
the 11th hour laborer said, what's everybody getting? What, what are they being paid? Well, I'm paying them a penny. Well, that's all right. We'll take a penny, too. Now, up front, I want to tell you laborers something. You're not going to get no more than what you asked for. If you don't decree a thing, God's not going to bring it to pass. You have not because you ask not. Now, sometimes you don't receive because you ask amiss to consume it upon your own lust. But if you abide in me, and my word abides in you, you can ask what you will, and it shall be done. Because we keep his commandments and do those things which are pleasing in his sight, we know that he will give us anything we ask for. Unless he's a liar and he's not. He said he would, and he will. So obey his commandments and do those things which are well pleasing in his sight. That's the epistle of John, John, first John. All right. Now everybody has agreed to a penny. You tonight at the telecast are not going to get no more or less than what you agree to. You want a penny? You want a day's wage, that is? Or maybe you want a hundred bucks or a couple of hundred bucks for the day's work. Or maybe you want to sow your seed into good kingdom soil like this soil and have it reproduce 60-fold, 30-fold, and 100-fold. It could do either one of the three. Depends what you ask for. Depends what you want. What you will agree to. You can agree not to be healed tonight, and you won't be. You can agree to be healed, and you will be. When we pray in a few minutes here, a couple minutes. Because we're all in agreement. Where two agree, it shall be done. Where two or three are gathered in his name, he's there. In the voice of two and three witnesses, every word's established. So there's power in the twos and threes. Now, I know there's only two or three people watching tonight. It would still work. I believe there's two or three thousand that watches. But that doesn't mean anything. It is you that counts. And you are going to get what you agree to. And do not, my friend, become a penny pincher tonight. Ask for what you need. And ask largely that your joy might be filled. And when you give an offering for this ministry, don't be a penny pincher either. Don't let Brother Freddie think that, hey, all I made today was a penny. Relatively speaking, everything you know is in proportion. Anyhow, that's what keeps us on the air, and keeps us in the tent, keeps the equipment going down the road. If you don't help me, I'm going to do it anyhow by faith. Somebody else will do it, and they'll get you a blessing. That's all I can tell you. All right. Matthew 20, verse 2. You will get what you ask for. You will get what you agree to. Now, at the end of the day, he lined them all up and paid them. And he paid the 11th hour people first. Now, why did he do that? To teach you that the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Okay? Everything's opposite to carnal reasoning when it comes to the spirit world. If you want to go up, you got to come down. If you want to leave, you got to die. If you want to receive, you have to give. If you want to find, you have to lose. If you want to be worthy, you must confess you're not worthy. It's like Naaman. Go jump in the mud and come out clean of your leprosy. So the 11th hour laborers got a penny. Then he paid the ninth hour. A penny? Why, those guys only work for an hour, and you give me a penny? Then he paid the third hour laborers. A penny? Why, I need more than a penny. I've been working most of the day, and look at these guys. They just showed up, and they got a penny, too. Then he paid the 6 o'clock in the morning, folks, you know, the, the early birds, the first ones into the vineyard. A penny 
And they all started murmuring and complaining. You know what Jesus said? I own these pennies, and I'll give them to who I want to. Are you evil because I'm good? It's not your penny to give people. If I want to give somebody an offering, I'm going to give them an offering. I'll pay them what I feel like they're worth. Besides, what did you agree to this morning? Uh-oh. Big mistake. The I agreed to a penny. Well, then you got just what you bargained for, and you got just what you asked for. Enjoy your penny. Now, you can enjoy your headaches and toe aches being healed tonight. Or you can enjoy, enjoy the COVID being cast out of you and the demon of cancer cast out of you. And you can have health, strength, and longevity and not have to die and give up the ghost prematurely. It's up to you. But whatever you ask for is what you're going to get. And if you don't get everything that somebody else got that don't look like they was worthy to get it, too bad. God's going to do what he will. I have mercy upon whom I have mercy. I have long suffering upon whom I have long suffering. I got one more, then I'll be done. This one's the dresser. Say it with me, the dresser. I'm still talking about the wine here, which comes from grapes, which comes from a vineyard, okay? This reference is Luke 13 and 6. Turn to it. Luke 13 and 6. Here we go again. There's another God involved. He spake also this parable a certain man. Now in this parable of Luke 13, 6, the certain man, of course, is God. He's the husbandman. He's the keeper of the vineyard. He's the owner of all things. He is the uh, good man of the house, all right? He spake this parable. A certain man had a fig tree, say fig tree, planted in his, his what? His what? His vineyard. <laughs> We're looking at wine again. Wine comes out of a vineyard. You could almost call it a wine yard instead of a vine yard which I think in certain countries it is pronounced that way. Anyway, a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and the certain man, the Lord himself, came and sought fruit on the fig tree, and he found none. Now get a picture. Here's a vineyard. You know what a vineyard looks like? It's just rows and rows of vines. There's no trees in it. It's all vines. No trees, all vines. Got it? But in this particular vineyard of the Lord Jesus Christ, there was a tree. It was a fig tree, which is a fruit-bearing tree, not a liquid juice-bearing vine, a fruit-bearing tree. Are you catching on yet? It's you. You're the fig tree in the vineyard of this world. Everything is the same. Status quo everywhere. If you've seen one, you've seen them all. Everywhere you look, it's all the same. McDonald's in every country and city of the world. It's all common. Common denominator. Nothing outstanding here. Oh, but one thing. A tree is in the midst of the vines. The tree towering high over the vines. That would be you. Are you bearing any fruit? Because the Lord is inspecting your limbs tonight, dear saint of God. And if there's no fruit, <laughs> here's the ver verdict, here's the judgment. He said to the dresser, remember I told you you're a dresser? Just like in the other, you was a uh, laborer. 
a steward, five wives or five foolish virgins, an Absalom or a Joab or a Ruth or a Peter or a Gideon. These are Bible characters. My. Seeing, therefore, that we are compassed about with such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. I have covered a great cloud of witnesses here tonight, and now I'm talking to the dresser. I'm not telling you to dress up. to beat the band and show off your good clothes. I'm not saying, I'm saying take care of your life. Jesus is the tree. His father is the husbandman. And you're the branches. It's the branches that bears fruit. And if there's no fruit on the branch because the branch is dead, it's going to be cut off and cast into the fire. I hope that's not where you're headed. These three years I come seeking fruit on this fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it the ground? Uh, Brother Dresser? Yes, Lord. I've been here for three years and that thing hasn't produced. One thing, that saint has not got off that pew that they've been warming to go to Walmart to go to Lowe's, to go to Publix, to go to the grocery store, to go even to, uh, what's that place again? Goodwill store. And find somebody to minister to and to pray for. And if they reject your prayer, who, what do you care? You're a dead man. You don't feel nothing. Just go find somebody else and pray for them. Talk to them. Pray for them. And get them in church. And at least bring the testimony to the saints in church. And they, they might work on their fig tree and start producing fruit. Boy, I'm acid, aren't I? And my heart, well, I'm a daddy. Though you have 10,000 counselors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? I'm a daddy and I'm a mama. We had 11 of them, so we know what raising kids is like. All right, I'm going to cut you down after three years. Oh, said the dresser. No, Lord, don't do it. Don't do it. Let it alone this year also. And if you just leave it for another year, give it one more chance. How many of you like to have one more chance to start producing fruit? I mean... If you're in a vineyard and everybody's producing wine and your job is to produce fruit, don't you think that if you're not doing your job, you're mighty conspicuous? You're the only tree there sticking out like a sore thumb. You've got no business even being in the vineyard. And if you're going to be where you don't belong, at least do something. Produce something because God is going to run out of patience and come cut you off after three years according to this parable. But the dresser, and that's you too, you are both the dresser and the fig tree. See that? Both dresser and fig tree. The dresser says, oh, Lord, I'm going to dig about it. I'm going to dung it. I'm going to shake it. I'm going to quake it. I'm going to skin it. I'm going to prune it. I'm going to grab a hold of it and shake the living daylights out of it. And make it produce some fruit. And if I can't do it in the fourth year, and four is an important number because Paul wants you to know what is the breadth and the length and the depth, but also the height. We don't live in a three-dimensional world. Saints of God live in a four-dimensional world world. You live in the spirit. Okay. Will you give me one more year? If it bear fruit well, and I'll go along with you next year, Lord, if that person 
is not producing fruit in a place where he shouldn't even be, if he's not producing fruit, then you can cut him down. So my first prayer of faith tonight is for all you people that needs one more chance to produce fruit and to accomplish something for God. I've covered all that I can now. I've, I'm finished preaching. I preached the message. Abel tell me how long it was, but this is how they used to preach in the old days. And the longer you preach this way, the more they got enraptured and translated and started floating around the church building, in the, floating around the congregation, up in a cloud, following the cloud, carried to the third heaven. Thank God. All right, first prayers for souls. Put up your hands and pray with me this prayer. <coughs> Repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, save my soul. Heal my backslidings. Set on fire my lukewarmness. Take the spots and wrinkles, the blemishes, the any such things from my garment. Let me be a glorious church headed for heaven. I repent of my sins. That means I'm sorry enough to quit them. I won't do it no more. Come in my heart. Cleanse me. Make me new. Heal me. I feel healing coming now. I shall be baptized in water by immersion. In Jesus' name, I shall be filled with the Holy Ghost. I shall be refilled tonight with the Holy Ghost. Speaking of new tongues, which is the least of the gifts, I ought to at least have the least of the gifts. Forgive me for putting baptisms born of water and spirit on the back burner. Fill my vessel. Help me to be ready. Lord, don't let me fail. Help me make the bride when my way is weak. Keep me by your side. When my road is long, Always let me see something in my life, Lord, you have done for me. Reinstate my name in the book. Get my mansion ready. I'm sanctified tonight. I shall see Jesus. Put up your hands down and thank God all over the countryside, around the world. Give him glory for your soul. What would it profit a man if he gained the whole world and lost his soul? I know that you want to be healed, but healing's only a band-aid. It only gives you longevity in this carcass of yours for a few more years. But if your soul is right, you have forever and forever and forever eternal life. This is the Promise he had promised us, even eternal life. Now, finally, the hour has come to pray for the sick. I could have done this at the beginning or in the middle, but I want to make you take your medicine tonight, give you a good shot in the arm, pardon the pun, 
but an inoculation of Holy Ghost Scripture. Yeah. And now let him send his word and heal you. Now he can really do it because it's gone forth, you see. Put up your hands. I perceive virtue going out of the hem. I perceive the throne of God being touched and us obtaining mercy. Come on with boldness. Get a little closer. Touch the throne. Touch the hem. Touch the Lord. Touch the screen. Put your hand on it. Point of contact. Prayer of faith. Moment of release. Here we go. Lord Jesus Christ, we come against sickness, disease, and infirmity in the bodies of all the faithful listeners here tonight that have endured the Word of God, and particularly for those who have enjoyed the Word of God. Cast the demon spirits of infirmity out of their flesh. Take every spirit of infirmity from them and bind it and put it into the deep and head on down to the lake of fire and report failure to Lucifer. Now heal their natural body from the physical world too, because there's only two worlds, natural, spiritual. Heal their outsides like you healed their soul on their insides. Receive new lungs. Here comes your lungs. Start breathing. Lung shelf in heaven by osmosis be poured into the chest of that person that needs it. There it is. All right. Go ahead and breathe. It's there. Breathe, I say, breathe. You're healed. Now you're the suffering of your heart. Heart shelf, angel. Thank you for a heart. Well, give me a thousand of them. All right. There's no distance in prayer. And there is no way that you can number the number that no man can number. Here they come. Grab your heart. Stick it in your chest. Put it right in there. Here it comes. Here's your heart, here's your heart, here's your heart, heart, heart. Here's all the rest of them. They're yours, enjoy. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin have left a crimson stain, but he left it white as snow. By his stripes ye were healed. Past tense, words, past tense. It's been done for 2,000 years. All you're doing is appropriating it tonight. And now here's a pair of kidneys for somebody. Kidneys, angel. Kidneys. 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 Bladder. 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 Spleen. Spleen. Colon. 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 Pancreas. Pancreas. Liver, liver, liver. Oh, God, put it in them. Take hepatitis. Take thyroid condition out. Here comes the new glands. New glands to the throat. Now your metabolism will be healed because you got a new thyroid. Heal their brains and their minds and take the fog out of their thinking. Give them photostatic memories that can learn the Word of God and quote it everywhere they go and speak it into existence. I thank you, Lord. Now take all those little organs like appendix and all those... Uh, Things I cannot even think of tonight. Every organ in their body, straighten it out. Hallelujah. Heal their toes. Heal their fingers. Their ankle bones and wrists. Their elbows and shoulder blades. And give them all brand new necks. I pray a mass miracle prayer for spines, backs. Even now, straighten out. In Jesus' name, let every back... Be healed in the mighty name of Jesus. Glory be to God. Thank God. 
Heal them. Free them. Arm of the Lord be revealed unto them. Blessed be God. Thank God. All right. Finally, COVID. COVID come out of them. Let every ounce of flu, any kind of flu whatsoever, come out of them. Raise them up. Let them not die of the death just because they're trying to depopulate the earth with jabs. We don't want any new side effects coming from something that is only designed to control us and not actually to heal us because even those that have COVID shots still get COVID. So Lord deliver us from it and don't let another plague like that come nigh our dwelling as the Bible said in Psalm 91. No matter where it's manufactured and sent from, may it not come upon us until we leave this world for the wrath of God falleth upon the children of disobedience and we're not appointed on the wrath but appointed on the salvation and we shall be saved. I'm saved. I'm being saved. And I shall be saved. Don't worry about them censoring me. They can't do that because I'm nowhere near as bad as the mainstream media talking these days and the things they're saying. That's for sure. And that is the, what really needs to be censored. Now we have prayer requests coming in here. Send them in. Text them. Send them on the live stream. Write them in a letter. Any way, shape, or form that you can get your prayer request to us. Seem like we pray all day long. You see my voice sounds a little bit hoarse. That's because I'm praying on the phone all day. Someone asked me one time, do you ever pray, Brother Freddie? <laughs> I don't think I do anything about it. Anyway, uh, send in your prayer request to uh, whatever shows on the screen, right? Our address is Freddie Clark, Post Office Box 625, Rocky Mountain, Virginia. And don't forget, PayPal is spelled P-A-Y-P-A-L. How many knows how to spell PayPal? A word to the wise is unnecessary. All right. We also have a square. And what's that other thing? Venmo. Venmo. We got, we got a few ways to receive an offering from you, so don't forget us. We're getting ready to hit the trail, the sawdust trail. The big old tent's going up again, third year in a row since we've been back in the tent ministry. Send your prayer requests. You're healed tonight. The Word of God healed some of you while it's being preached because advanced Christians can sit in their seat listening to the Word of God and be healed while they're listening to it. For He sent His Word and healed them. Is that it? God bless you. My brother Abraham, don't tell me how long I went tonight. But the good old saints, they're going to stick with me and watch this and receive from it. God bless you till next Sunday night when I'll try to do a 15 minute discourse. Fingers crossed. <laughs> tell them good night, Mama. Praise the Lord. Good night. We love you and thank you all for watching tonight and may God bless you. Tell him good night, cameraman. He likes to hide, but I'm revealing who he is. His name is Abraham. Good night, Abraham. Good night, everybody. Next Sunday night, 8 o'clock, 8 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. Amen. Act like you're in a meeting tonight. Shout like you're in a meeting tonight. Meeting of the old camera. Victory tonight. There's going to be victory.